How you doing, everyone? My name is Matthew Hodgkins, and I'll be talking about uh, chat ops with PowerShell. So how many of you guys um, have written a script for someone else, like someone in your team or someone in your organization? Yep. And how, was, how did you expect them to react when you did that? Was it something like this? You know, they were going to be super excited that you gave them all this automation. It was going to save them a ton of time, and you know, they were going to be so happy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, did it actually happen like that once? Okay. Was it perhaps uh, a little bit more like this? Yeah, so, so everyone's had that feeling before. Okay, so I'll try and show you today how chat ops can help you sort of get over this situation. So here's a look at the agenda. So I'm going to be talking about what chat ops is and how it can help you. I'm going to be talking about some chat bots, um, how to get that installed. I'm going to show you some code examples about how to use your chat ops with some PowerShell. And then I'm going to touch a little bit on security. So, does anyone have any ideas why this happens? What's, what's your experience been around this? Why, why, does, why do your PowerShell scripts never land correctly? People? Yeah? Yep, yep, exactly. You know, people that aren't used to using PowerShell. Any other ideas? They're stupid, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so here's a couple that I had. Um, so distribution is pretty hard. So say you're trying to write a PowerShell script for like a help desk team. How are you going to distribute that out to them? Do you go to their machine and install it? Do you put it on a network share or something like that? Um, when you make updates, how are they going to, going to get that? You know, distribution with PowerShell is a little bit hard for people that, that don't use it. Another one is the command prompt is forgotten, like you just mentioned. So um, if people aren't doing this sort of thing day to day, they're just going to fall back to their old, old bad habits about you know, uh, clicking things together. You know, they're not really thinking about you know, PowerShell is going to solve any problems for me because it's, just, it's not in their, their mentality. The other one is permissions. So even, even though you've written a script for someone, you've written a script for your help desk, and um, you know, that can re do stuff in production. So how do you handle permissions and credentials for that? Do you give like a help desk staff full access to production, full access to remote into that system to do things? Do you use things like Jira and try and lock them down? You know, there's uh, some problems around permissions. So um, hopefully we can solve that uh, with some chat ops, and I'll show you how to do that. So first of all, what is chat ops? Um, so hopefully in your company, you've got some people sort of sitting in a, a chat channel. Um, it's about bringing tools into the chat with them. So you're already doing all your communicating there. So why can't you take actions and, and use your tools in there as well? Um, it's about making work more visible. So how many people work with someone that, um, you know, something breaks and then they just put their head down and they just say fixed and you never find out what they actually fixed? Yeah. Does that happen sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, so um, you know, it's a big problem. So what chat ops can do is, is bring the tools into sort of a visible view that you can see what's happening, you can see what someone's doing, you can see what actions they're taking, which can be pretty helpful. Um, the other thing is communication and automation are in the same place. So um, you know, in our company, we have people coming into our Slack channel and asking us sorts of questions and asking us, you know, can you help me with this? And um, it's cool to have you know, from there, yeah, I can pull the logs for you. you know, here's a command, I'm going to pull the logs down. Here's a command, I'll make a ticket for that for you, right in, in line chat. So next time they might not have to even come to you, they can just uh, you know, do it themselves. And that's, that's the beauty of having the communication and the tools right in the same spot. So here's some examples of tools you could bring into chat. You might have like a, a really terrible application that you have to manage, which I used to have to manage, um, that, where you could like restart services in production. So you might have a help desk that's working at 3 a.m. and instead of them calling you to just restart a service, you can let them do it. Um, you might be able to add users to Active Directory or you know, give access to HR to updates and properties in Active Directory for you. Um, like I mentioned, you might be able to create some tickets there. Um, if you're doing some deployment, um, you can kick off deployments from your, your channel. And um, it's good for troubleshooting, so say pulling event logs from systems or pulling you know, um, metrics from systems. So, in the troubleshooting process, you can be you know, in line pulling information from all the services. So what are the benefits for this? So the, the really big one here is the chat tool acts as your sort of GUI. So you don't have to write anything about the GUI. You just use chat that everyone's really familiar with. They've got it on their phones. And they can start doing commands to the, to the PowerShell scripts that you've already written. So you've got all these advanced scripts, which are saving a ton of time. With chat ops, you can pretty much just make it be the entry point into that script for people, and it makes their life a lot easier. Like, like I mentioned before, transparency. So 
You know, um, this gets away from people running these things in the command line. You don't know what they're doing. It sort of brings it um, into the chat so you can see what they're doing and see how they're doing things. And this really helps in onboarding people. So imagine a scenario where it's the first day you've got a new staff member join you and you've got a production outage. So you start, you know, pulling logs from the servers. You start restarting services. You can update your website and say, hey, we're having some issues, all from chat. And then you haven't even spoken to this new guy yet. But already he's aware of how to update the website, how to pull logs, how to you know restart services because he can see inline exactly what you're doing in these sort of situations. So it helps you even having to talk to people, which is pretty sweet. So how does this benefit you? Yeah. <laughs> so how does this benefit you? Well, all those scripts that you wrote can finally be consumed by people. They have a really easy barrier to entry, and you you know they'll start to love your automation now. So let's have a quick talk about bots. So this is the bot experience. I'm sure you've all chatted to a chat bot or something before, but pretty much there's a person sitting in your channel. So I call my bot Bender, or you know, I like Futurama names. Um, so he sits in the channel, you, you type commands to him, and he'll respond when he knows you know, what actions to take. So the bot that we're going to be looking at today is called Urbot, which is based on Python. We'll be using Slack, and I'll show you how to mix in some PowerShell with that. So this is pretty much how you get it installed. So you can go to my Git repo there, um, Matt Hodge slash Windows Urbot, and you can grab the full installation scripts and all the code for this. But pretty much the basics is you're going to use Chocolate if you to install Python. You're going to install Git. You're going to install the Python package manager, which is very similar to you know, how the PowerShell modules work. It just pulls the modules in. And then there's a requirements.txt, which has all your dependencies that the, the bot needs to start up. So I'll show you how to bring a, an Urbot online. The first thing we're going to need is an API key. So um, that's how the bot knows how to communicate with Slack. So you can get that if you just go into apps and integrations, type in bot, and then you can just click add configuration and put in your bot's name. And then you'll get the API key here. <laughs> Don't take a picture of that one. Um, so, <laughs> so that's what you're going to use. And, uh, and yeah, it'll go after this. <laughs> so that's what the bot's going to use to communicate. So I've already got one of those um, configured. So um, pretty much you're just going to set it as an environment variable. So you can just go to so in advanced settings, environment variables, and then in here. We've got one uh, where you're going to stick your environment variable. So that's how the bot's connecting. So when you've got that sorted, there's a little PowerShell script here, just called start bot. There we go. And that's going to start the bot connecting. So if we switch back over to Slack here, you'll see that the bot calculon is going to come online in a second. Let's just come online. Now we can um, invite him to the channel. Okay, and we've got a bot sitting in the channel now, and then we can do a help command, and the bot will respond with all the commands he has. So that's how quick it is to get a bot online. Okay, so the um, the next thing I want to talk about is how you deploy this bot in your organization. So in this example, you'd want to have um, the bot um, installed, say, on, on a Windows system inside your organization so it can reach out and touch certain things. So for instance, it's going to listen to the messages coming from Slack, and it's going to take action. So you might, say, do a REST API call out to GitHub to make a, a repository for you. Or you might use like the Azure or AWS commandlets to you know, take action against the cloud. Or you might have a SQL server that you can do SQL commands in and do queries and pull data back and then put it into the channel. Or you might use um, you know, WinRM and PowerShell remoting to connect to a domain controller and say update some property. So that's the advantage of having the bot deployed inside your, your organization. Hmm. Ship, it. Uh, ship it squirrel? No, this one doesn't support ship it squirrel. <laughs> OK, so I'm, I'm going to show you some folder structure for Urbot and then a little hello world. So the way um, Urbot's structured, it has a plugins directory. And in here is where you put the code for the plugins you want to have. So um, the first one we're going to do is hello. So do help hello. And these are the commands that um, are available in the hello module. So we'll just say hello. 
and the bot's going to return hello world. So I'll show you the code for that. So just up the top here, this is just standard stuff that you're going to have in every file. Um, we define a class, just like in PowerShell, and hello is the name of the module, but it's also where all the commands are going to be stored under. So when you do the, the help hello, it's just listing these commands. Then we have this decorator up here saying this is going to be a command that we're exposing to the user. The command name is hello. And then it's pretty much going to say um, yield hello world. So it's just like in PowerShell, is a write output or a, a return. And you also notice here we've got some um, inline help, just like we do in PowerShell functions, uh, which is going to fill in the help out here. So it's very similar to the way PowerShell is working with help. The next command we're going to try is we're going to try passing a parameter to a command and see what, see what the bot does. So we'll say, say my name, Matt. The bot's going to return Matt. And the way it does that, um, we're defining an arg argument parameter here. And just like in PowerShell advanced functions, you can define your parameters. So we're saying there's going to be a parameter called name with type string. And then we're pretty much just doing a write output and putting the, uh, the variable that the user passed in into the string. So very similar to how PowerShell works. OK, so that's, that's all pretty good and easy, but it doesn't look very nice. So um, there's a couple of options with Slack. You can format your text. So you can use um, you know, asterisks to bold some stuff. You can use um, you know, uh, block quotes, backticks for emphasis, and you can do code blocks and stuff like that. So if we say, uh, and the bot can return multiple things. So I'll show you the code for that. OK, so we're just going to do pretty basic. It's just multiple write output statements. So you can have the, the bot say multiple things in a row. And we're just using some escaping here. So just like in PowerShell, you'd use backticks to escape certain characters. You can do the same in Python. Um, we also have this code block down here. And it's very sim similar to a here string in PowerShell. So we want the formatting over to the left-hand side. And this is a big block of text. We're setting that to a variable and then just returning it. And then you can use uh, links to GIFs and images. And it'll display those just like normal. OK, so um, let's talk about Slack formatting. So how do we bring PowerShell into this equation? So it's going to be pretty simple. Um, we're just going to call PowerShell.exe. And we're going to use dash command and then the ampersand and put our code in there. Then we're just pretty much going to capture the result and then send that to Slack. So it's pretty simple. So have a look at our PowerShell example. We have a couple of commands here. So we'll try uh, get date. OK, so it's given us you know, the PowerShell-like date. So let's go and have a look how that, look, that works. So up the top, top here, we've defined a function called run ps inline. And it takes a parameter. And that's going to be the PowerShell script that you want to execute. And then we're, doing, we're building a string here with the ampersand, the curly braces, and just putting the PowerShell command just inside there. And then we're calling a, this is a Python subprocess. So it's going to call PowerShell.exe dash command and then pass in a bit of PowerShell. I'm going to capture the result, and we decode it, because that's just a Python on Windowsy thing, and then going to return. So that functions we're going to use in our code to sort of yeah, return. Yes? Yep, that you pass in. So we're going to define the PowerShell um, inside our code so the user couldn't pass that in there. So we're not going to allow the user to just type PowerShell in, because that's going to be a big security problem. <laughs> OK, and then we're going to um, use that down here. So this is the get date function. So you can see. Um, just like before, we're defining a, the name get date, and here's our PowerShell script, just get date, and that's where we put the PowerShell. And then it's going to call that function, and then return a string with that date in it. That's how that works. We'll do another one. So get last boot. Okay, so we have a bit of formatting this time. Let's have a look how this looks. So this time we've got a bit of a bigger PowerShell script in line here. So we're um, just using a last boot variable. We're doing get sim instance, and we're trying to find out the last boot time. We're going to set that to a variable. And then this time we're doing our formatting in PowerShell. So you really have the option here. If you're comfortable with Python, you can do the formatting there. Or if you're more comfortable with PowerShell, you can format all your stuff in PowerShell and then just return the nicely formatted output that you want. So you can see here we're using the double back ticks, because that's how we have to escape stuff in PowerShell. And we're putting the variable inside, and that's how that's working. Now, um, with all these scripts that you've already written, we want an easy way to sort of execute those. So um, let's have a look at the get service. 
and try bits, for instance. And you can see it returns some um, information about the state of the service. So we can just try another one. See that the, the spooler surface is running. So where this one works, um, we have a, another function here. And the only difference is that it's just going to um, find the path that, of the PowerShell script that you want it, want it to run, which we're going to pass in as a parameter. And then it's just going to dot source that script first and then run your PowerShell script. So this is how you can get all your, the PowerShell functions that you've written into your, into your code. And then the rest is just exactly the same. So we're passing in the function name that we're going to call this time and, and the parameters we're passing it. And if we go down here, um, if we have a look, so pretty much um, here's how we're doing it. We're building the name from the parameter they passed in. We're going to run the function, just um, get service bot for PS1, get service bot, and then the parameters. And we can have a look at our uh, PowerShell script here. So it's just, just a normal PowerShell function that you're used to doing. So getting the service and then formatting the output here and, and writing it out. So what happens um, if we do this? service that doesn't exist. So that might look pretty familiar to you. It's just normal PowerShell out, like error output. So um, how would we handle this situation in our normal scripts? You know, how do we format it so it's nice for our end users? Yep, exactly. So we, I'm just going to use a try catch block. So if we go and refactor our script here, This time we're just going to use error action preference stop and we're going to try to get the service and format it in a certain way and then we're going to catch um, if, if it doesn't exist we're going to return a better message. So let's try that again. And this time we've got nice error handling. So we can just keep our logic all inside PowerShell just like we normally do. We can have a really nice user experience for our, our Slack functions. So the next one um, is PowerShell remoting. So it's all good and well to be running PowerShell locally on this machine, but obviously we want to start taking action against machines in our environment. So um, there's two ways to do this. You can do um, you know, PowerShell remoting like normal, like enter PS session or invoke you know, commands remotely, or you can use a module called PyWinRM, which is a super nice way to just do PowerShell remotely without having to you know, um, do the invoke command stuff. So I'll show you how that works. We have a couple of commands here, so let's just try a, uh, a stop service on a remote system. So I have a different machine over here. On PowerShell, get its IP address. Okay, I'll try stop service bits on this machine. Okay, it's telling us that it's stopped. Okay, so it's stopped, and then we can try um, our start service. And then we can see that it's, it's running again. So um, I'll show you the code for how this works. So this time we're importing a module called the WinRM, which is the PyWinRM, which is installed as part of that requirements.txt. We're building another function here to run PowerShell remotely. So we're going to take a computer name, a port, a username, a password, and then the script that we want to run remotely. And we're joining the computer name and port together. Just that this is how the module, um, the PyWinRM module takes a computer name. And then this is how we make a session. So winrm.session, the computer name with the port, and then um, the username and password that you pass in to the function. And we do session.runps and we put our script there. So that's how easy it is to run uh, remote session, remote PowerShell from Python. It's super easy. Um, then we capture the output and we, we use a hash table this time. So we're catching an exit code, which is going to be zero if, uh, if it's a success, or it's going to be higher than zero if there's a failure in running the PowerShell script. And then we're catching the standard out, which you can see there we're decoding again. So we're just capturing it just like before. And then here's our, our function. So we're taking a couple more parameters here. We've got a computer name, a service name, and optionally we can pass in a, a port, and then we've got um, a default port here. So just like in PowerShell advanced functions, you can set defaults if the user doesn't pass in certain values. 
Um, then we're building stop service with the name. We're passing in the name of the service. And then we run the remote PowerShell. Now, I've hard-coded the username and password for this box here, so just never do that. I'll show you how to handle this um, in a secure way shortly. Um, and then we're capturing the exit code. If it's a zero, we're returning a, a nice message. Otherwise, we're going to return a failure. So in this time, if we do start service, so this time we're capturing that error in a, in a Python way. So like I mentioned before, you know, depending on how comfortable you are, um, you can do things you know, in either way. So security. So the first one is uh, don't store your passwords in code. You know, that's a pretty obvious one, but um, you know, there's better ways to store your passwords. So one option if you um, if you're part of a domain and your your bot's running, you know, it could be running under a domain service account. You know, it might be able to already have permission to to take action against things in your you know, your environment. If not, I'll show you a way to handle that. The other one to think about is auditing these commands. So pretty much these bots are going to be sitting in your channels and they're going to be able to do anything to your, your environments. You know, whatever you expose to the users, they're going to be able to run at any time. So you want to have a way to sort of track what's happening and what they're doing. And I'll show you how to handle that. And then you want to be selective um, with access to these commands. So say you've got you know, 500 people in your channel, in your company, you don't want every single person to be able to like restart production services. You know? So you want to try and limit that to specific people. And I'll show you how to handle that. So, um, security. So let's go and have a look at that. We've got a, a secrets example here. Okay, so I've got a basic one, get key. Okay, so I'm saying there's no password that's been set. So we're going to have a look at the code for this. We're using another Python module here called Keyring. And what it allows you to do is pull passwords from the network credential store and use those in your Python script. So it's pretty much get Keyring, get password, and then um, the machine name that you're going to store the password for and the username. And that's going to pull in the password into this, this variable here. So um, it's saying there's no password set. So let's go on set one. So we're just going to add a generic credential here. We're going to call it demo, and then username, and we can put in whatever password we want. Try get key again, and it's going to pull the password back that you stored in that. So um, this is the advantage of using Python for some stuff, because that, that is super easy to do in Python. But you know that's several lines of PowerShell just to, to pull that password from the network credential store in PowerShell. Um, so the next thing we want to have a look at is auditing. So let's go and refactor one of our scripts that we had before to do some auditing this time. So we're going to go and refactor um, our get service command. So um, we're just going to uncomment this section. So pretty much what we're going to do is just run the command like normal. And then when we've returned the result to the user, we're going to run another PowerShell script. And as you can see here, it's just going to write to the event log. Um, it's going to write under the source erbot um, and then Put a message here so it's telling you the user that ran it what they ran and, and what the result was so we'll save that and we just need to get the the bot to sort of update its module because we've made a change here so, plugin, reload, example. And that'll reload the plugin and then i'll just open the event log on this machine Run our command. Okay, so our commands run like normal. You can see we've got a new event in there now. And this is the event. So it's saying in this channel, this user ran this command, and this was the result we gave to them. So now you can come in here and pick this up with you know whatever logging tool you like, um, and you know scrape these logs, and you can report on them you know just like you normally would. Um, so the question was, yeah, can we only write to the application log? You can pretty much do anything you want. So um, you know, if you, you've got some sort of logging framework you're using at work that you're writing um, logs in it with PowerShell, you can just use that. So it's really up to you how you, you want to handle this. OK, so the next thing um, is security, uh, is the running of, of certain commands and locking down specific users. So what Urbot gives is um, an access controls um, configuration option. So um, we're pretty much saying here that with the get service command, 
the allowed users to be able to run this command is, is just fake user. I'm not fake user, so let's see what happens when we, we make this change. So with this change, because it's on the configuration level, we have to restart the bot, which of course we can do by chat too. So the bot's back online, and now we'll try the get service again. And it's saying I'm not allowed to run this command anymore. So that's how easy it is to cr create whitelists and blacklists for commands um, in your company. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Will the command show up in help? I don't know. Let's try that. Yeah, it's going to tease me with it. It's going to tell me about it, but I just won't be able to run it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just tease them with it. All right, so um, to wrap things up, we, we chatted about chat ops and how it can be used to really um, you know, get the most out of the PowerShell that you've already written. We had a look at bots and specifically Urbot, which is a Python-based bot. We had a look at how to deploy that, so you've just got a basic install script to do that. Um, then we had a look at integrating PowerShell, so just passing the parameters to it just like you normally would, just from Python this time. And then we just briefly touched on security, so you can really um, have a bot that's very secured inside your organization. So um, here's your action plan to get this started in your company. So um, pretty much go to that Git repo and clone it down. Run install urbot.ps1 and all your dependencies will be there. You're going to get um, your Slack um, API key and put it in your environment variable and run start urbot.ps1 and your bot will be online in Slack. And from there you can just start putting a little bit of Python wrapper around your scripts and, and away you go. And then finally, uh, your team will be like this when you give them new scripts now. They're going to be able to run it from their phones if they, they have you know the chat running on their phones. It's going to be super easy for them to, to handle this. So. So, is there any questions? Yep. So the question is, was there a reason I wrote this in Python? So um, the reason I, I didn't write this, this is a, a pre-existing uh, thing that was out there and it has all sorts of you know handy things like that, inbuilt help. I don't have to do anything. I just put a bit of comment and it handles that whole thing. So if I was to write this you know, myself, I've had some questions before, like why don't you just write this in PowerShell? I'd have to write all this functionality and um, it just comes right out of the box. That's why I decided to use it. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks very much, guys. Thank you.
appreciate when I have a session as well. It's always good to have a picture of it. I'll try to ask some basic questions so you can easily look at it.